Pro Group Management. Workers' comp that works for you. Welcome to Nevada News Megs on the broadcast today. We're recapping the special session with State Senator Heidi Gansert here for the whole show on our all new Nevada Newsmakers. Retail's impact on Nevada's economy? Enormous. 8,600 businesses, large and small, employing 145,000 workers. And last fiscal year, retail paid tax on nearly $60 billion in sales. We're the Retail Association of Nevada. We support retail, we help it grow, and we mean business. R-A-N-N-V dot org. Pro Group Management specializes in providing industries with the necessary components to satisfy and exceed workers' comp requirements. Every business has unique needs and specific regulations. Pro Group Management stays ahead of the curve, providing up-to-date services to keep your industry in top form. Discover how we simplify your tasks, improve efficiency, and reduce expense to keep you moving in a positive direction. Pro Group Management. Workers comp that works for you. Truck drivers are some of the hardest working people you'll meet delivering over 70% of America's freight and 92% of Nevada's. When there's a natural disaster, they're delivering critical supplies to help those communities recover and rebuild. Every sector of the economy and our nation's military rely on truck drivers. So let's take a moment to say thank you. On the open road or city streets, our truck drivers are rolling to make our economy and our nation stronger. Trucking moves America forward. This is Nevada Newsmakers with host Sam Shad, a no-holds-barred political forum. Now, from the Nevada Newsmakers broadcast headquarters, here is Sam Shad. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, we're always pleased to welcome back to the program State Senator Heidi Ganser. Pleasure to have you here. You've had a couple of days to recover from the special session. Um, uh, the editorial in the Las Vegas Review Journal uh, said, a dozen days in Carson City, question mark, for what, question mark, your response. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me on the show. And I have my mask, but we are socially distanced. We um, got used to wearing these masks all the time for 12 days. Uh, so, you know, the special session was about resetting the budget. And from day one, what we started to do was examining what the governor had presented. And what we found is there was quite a bit more money in reserves. When you look at the original budget, th there was just um, tremendous cuts to the Medicaid budget. So services like dental care, prosthetic devices for some of our poorest, most at-risk individuals. So we, I worked very closely with Senator Ben Kiekeffer on trying to recraft the budget. Um, we also were looking with Democrat leadership for, for quite a bit of time during the beginning. It kind of fell apart towards the end. But you know, part of what you have to do is make sure that you've um, looked under every pillow and, and gathered as much money as you can to restore what you can. And uh, what, what we found is that there was quite a bit of money. So we found about $160 million that we could restore. And when you look at restorations, especially for Medicaid, there's a match. So for every dollar we put in, the federal government puts in three, $3 or so. Um, and we put together a, a budget where we had about $162 million that we thought we could add back. And with that money, we put quite a bit in the Medicaid budget. And with the federal match, it was almost 400 million ad in ad backs, which which was huge. And then we so really so it's about a third of what you needed. Yeah, well, and it's, so it's a little bit different because when you talk about Medicaid, you have state general fund, and so when we were putting back a certain amount, 115 million dollars in Medicaid, um, or excuse me, in state general funds, the match on that was 268 million dollars. So for 115 general fund dollars, we got 268 federal dollars. So together, it's about 385. Um, so that money would go back, but it wasn't a fully an offset of general fund. And then we really focused on K-12. We were shocked at the, the numbers in K-12 and how um, the majority party was trying to take more out of K-12 than even the governor proposed with some of the cuts. And why do you think that was? I, you know what? I could not figure it out. And I think that we literally had to go over it and over it and over again, it, that the numbers with them, um, so that the body understood and there was also CARES Act that was available. That and was they, what, 50 million? Well, in the, at the very end, I think once the majority party realized that they were 
um, expanding and adding to the cuts to K-12, and we had to hammer that point home, they decided they would use some CARES Act money and, and move it over to K-12 through education, which I thought was the right thing to do. But you know what they were doing is they were spending money on restoring um, public employee pay. And at, at the tune of about $40 million between some furlough addbacks and some merit pay, which didn't make any sense to me. When you look at the state, and we have the private sector having been shut down for months, especially our largest industry gaming, and all these small businesses struggling, unemployment rates hitting close to 30%, I felt it very appropriate that public employees take a cut of about 4.6%. It just, it, it pales in comparison to how the private sector is suffering. And would that have been the one day a month? Yeah, uh, so they went from a one day a month to essentially six days for this calendar year. What they're doing is they're going to make it one day a month, but it doesn't start till January. And our fiscal year starts from, it's July 1 to June 30th. So instead of 12 days in a, mu in a year, it was six days. That add back and then also some merit pay were very expensive, over $40 million. And that money could have been spent on, on, on K through 12 education. It could have been spent on health and human services. So I, uh, I, you know, I had a lot of, and I made that statement on the floor. When we have the private sector suffering like they are and, and really ravaged by this, this COVID, um, the economy is ravaged by COVID, we really need to think about making some cuts in the budget. You know, that's why we were there. Um, what were your thoughts on the revelation that um, unions had contributed $250,000 uh, towards the state Democratic Party uh, prior to the uh, well, special session? Well, you know, I, I guess I was just shocked. I was I was stunned at the, the level of donations um, to certain candidates, certain candidates and their PACs. It was substantial. It wasn't just a, you know, a small amount of money. $250,000 went into the PACs and to different funds to support uh, the majority party right before we have the special session. So, you know, they ended up getting $40 million in ad backs. The public employees did. So it's, you know, it's, it is what it is. Um, also, um, we're talking about public education, K through 12, mm -hmm. the fight between the governor's office and the Clark County School Superintendent. What was that all about, in your opinion? <laughs> yeah, there, there was a very public heated debate. There was a bill that was proposed on the... By the way, heated debate is a very polite <laughs> way of putting it. It was basically get out. <laughs> well, um, over on the assembly side, a bill was introduced and no one seemed to want to claim it. Like, who, who wanted this legislation to, to sweep some reserve accounts? And that's where it started. And I'm not on the assembly side, but it sounded like it was very heated over there. And then basically, you know, they were kind of calling each other out who, who was telling the truth and who was lying. Um, so, you know, this special session was frustrating in that the, the budget and what we needed to do was not well prepared when we walked in, because this is something that you can usually do in th maybe three days, four days. And I know the Republicans on the Senate side, um, I worked with Ben Kiefer, he, he and I had put together a, a draft budget uh, presented on July 13th. So July 13th, within five days of starting the session, maybe even four days, we had something that was a pretty good working draft. Eventually, we sent it out the following Friday. So that was on a Monday, we gave them a draft, and on a Friday, we ba basically said, you know, this is our budget and these are our priorities. We want to prioritize health and human services and K through 12 education, and we know we can do it. We know the money's available because of reserves, because of tax amnesty, because we're moving some other general funds around. Um, so it was kind of frustrating going through the process because the original budget just wasn't as prepared. When, you're, when you have line items that say, we're not going to provide prosthetic devices to people with, with Medicaid, we're not going to provide dental care to children, we're not going to provide mental health services to children, you have a problem. And that's why it was so important that we evaluated the budget and, and was able, we were able to add back some funding to those critical programs. Um, do you put the blame on the governor's office? And the governor, obviously, being the governor, has to take responsibility for that. Or do you put it on you know, leadership on the Democratic side? Well, I have to tell you, the proposal comes from the governor's office. But what's happened in the past, and I, I have the benefit of ex the experience of the recession, right? So what typically happens is that the governor's fiscal staff works with the legisl legislative fiscal staff, and they come up with consensus um, reserves and budgets and things, you know, for, for different departments. So I think there was a gap between the um, executive and legislative branch fiscal staffs. And if that, that homework would have been done together, we would have had a very different budget as a starting point when we entered this special session. Um, 
where do you lay the blame for that? I mean, quite frankly. I mean, because I, I, I can't imagine this happening in a Kenny Gwynn administration or a Brian Sandoval administration. And both of those, I'm going to make the point here, and you don't have to agree with me, but they were pretty centrist governors. They, they were not leaning either way. Once they became mm -hmm. governors, they seemed to be the governor for the whole state. So, you know, I, I think we, the majority party, and we have much in common. You which can call them Democrats, by the way. Democrats, <laughs> the Democrats and the Republicans. We, and I, I said this on the floor, we want to help children. We want to make sure at-risk people are taken care of. Um, and so we had to evaluate the budget, but really the fiscal staffs needed to work together. And I think we would have seen that um, in the past. They would have worked more closely. And fiscal staff is, is not partisan. So our legislative staff helps us and they help the Democrats um, to put together the numbers. And so I think there could have been homework early on. But in the end, we were able to restore some of the really um, significant and hurtful cuts that were on the table. And none of them are easy. I mean, we still have cuts that, were, that are there, that, that well, have I'm stayed. And, and you know, there's nothing we can do about some of the cuts, but we tried to, to really pinpoint where, it was, where they were the worst. Uh, the autism community was <sighs> just devastated. I've done a lot of work around autism. I, 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 I And I, I sponsored a bill to help us get more RBTs, um, the folks who, who work with the kids for, uh, during early intervention. That was on my list, I can tell you that. I mean, it was, I think it was 5.2 or $5.7 million. That was one of my first ad backs because if you could have in early intervention, it changes the path of the life of that child. So I was really frustrated about the, the cut in autism. But, but in the end, the Democrats, the majority party, have control over what you know, eventually passed. How did the state budget director perform, in your opinion? Um, you know, I, I think that she was doing the best that she can. So you, if you just look at experience, the legislative fiscal staff has been doing this for decades. And so she, she as well has strong experience but when you work together, you get a better outcome. And that's one of the messages that I brought to the legislature too. Diversity of ideas, diversity of perspectives, and on fiscal staff, both of them approaching these budgets and the reserve accounts and looking at things like tax amnesty together, they would have yielded a better result before we even walked through the door. Did the governor lay out his plan it doesn't appear so, but I, I want your opinion, not mine. Uh, did he lay out his plan strongly enough, or did he basically say, okay, this is what we need to cut uh, in terms of dollars. Legislature, you take it over now and, and hand it back to me. What I've seen with this governor is sort of the handoff. So he may come up with an idea, um, and in this case, he had a budget right, and then he wanted us to evaluate it. But that's our job, so that's okay. It's okay that he handed it off. It would have been nice if the numbers were tighter and better evaluated when we started so that we wouldn't have spent 12 days. Um, and, and what was his involvement on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, did you see him in the building at all? Or was he communicating with people like yourself? Because, uh, you know, I, I doubt that there's anybody more knowledgeable about the budget uh, in the legislative building than you are. So, um, you know, actually, the, the, we have really good members on our in our caucus, like Ben Keefer. So ben, Ben's been on finance for quite a while. I've had the benefit of having experience in the legislative and executive branch working on the budget at you know, very high levels and, and deep levels as well. So you know what, uh, instead of saying did they reach out to me, what I can tell you is that I reached out to the Democrat leadership and said how can I help? How can, how can we help craft this, this, this budget um, and, and revamp the budget because I brought knowledge, Ben Keefer brought knowledge. Um, that really, and that's why we had sort of a draft as early as July 13th. Okay, so was the response, that would be great, we'd appreciate that, we need to do this in a bipartisan way, or was it, you know, we just need one of you guys in the Senate to come our way and we don't need you? <laughs> so what, what pretty much happened is early on, we were working very well with the Democrat leadership on the Senate side. And then of course, they have to work with the assembly and with the governor, and it sort of just fell apart from there. So early on, we were working together and they were very open to listening our, to our ideas on both sides, because part of it is, um, Ben and I have some experience as far as looking for sources of revenue. So you've basically put together sources and uses of funds. And so what have we done in the past? Um, a particular example would be tax amnesty. When they brought the budget forward, they had $10 million as the expectation from a tax amnesty program. In 2008 and 2010, two years apart, we did tax amnesty programs. We yielded $20 million and $28 million. So why you would have $10 million on the books when you know you haven't had one in 10 years, and when you ran them back to back, you yielded $48 million, didn't make a lot of sense. 
So things like that, knowing to look at that and, and start questioning, why did you pick $10 million? What has happened historically? How much are our, our accounts receivables right now? Those are the types of things people with experience ask, and we started. I started asking those questions day one. I asked those questions, and I also asked about reserves. How much money are in reserves? What's your typical inflow? What's your typical outflow? And if you've, if you've swept some, what's left? And we found quite a bit of money just re-examining reserves, but you have to ask the right questions. And so I, I know some of my colleagues um, were, and I were asking those questions on the Senate side. You know, I've interviewed you many, many times over the years, and I don't think I've ever seen you quite as angry as this before. Oh, I'm not angry at all. I'm not angry. I'm just, really? I just know we can do better. Frustrated? Well, you know, so, so me, what I know is that we can do better, and we have our most at-risk populations, and we have K through 12 who were taking significant cuts. And when you can do better by the citizens of Nevada, then we, you have to, right? That, that's our job. Our job is to try to do the best that we can. And again, there are still significant cuts that were left, but we were able to put, do some add backs that are gonna make a difference in people's lives. So it's not just money on, on, on paper, it's people's lives that are affected. And you brought up autism, you know, and I'm really sensitive to autism because I, I look at those families and the children and you wanna, you wanna help them because it changes the path. And then when I was looking at K through, um, K through 12, they cut the read by third grade program. Every child should be expected to read by third grade and we should do everything that we can to make sure that they are able to read by third grade. And when you cut $30 million out of a program like that, you're, the consequences are significant, significant. And so those are the types of things that really bothered me about the proposed budget that um, we were able to fix a lot of it, but not all of it. Okay, so not angry, not frustrated. No bothered I'm not sure I'm not no, sure I'm, 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 not I'm, sure. I'm sorry I'm bringing a little levity here but yeah but bothered I bothered because I like to work together we want I think we have common goals and when you bring people who have experience and different perspectives you get a better outcome and that's what I'm about all right let's take a break we'll come back more with State Senator Heidi Ganser we'll see if we can get her fired up here <laughs> after this time out because of UMC there's a wide open road ahead of me Because of UMC, she can grow up with her twin sister. Because of UMC, I'm here to help you. UMC, the highest level of care in Nevada. Hi, I'm Eric Robnett, owner of Home Energy Experts. Has this ever happened to you? Honey, did you remember to turn down the thermostat? <sighs> Forgetting to set the temperature? Not fun. We can help. Our new smart thermostat keeps the temperature set for your comfort all by itself. I'm feeling hot now. <sighs> to increase your comfort, go to homeenergyexperts.com for details. That's homeenergyexperts.com. As you know, Reno is booming. Toll's development company is helping it grow with insightful design and development, building community with every project, adding beauty, adding excitement, emphasizing our shared humanity. Reno is becoming bigger. Toll's development is helping it become better, more livable, more enjoyable. To learn more, go to tollsdevelopment.com, tollsdevelopment.com. This is Nevada Newsmakers. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, we continue our conversation with State Senator Heidi Gansert. We are taping this on July 22nd, so you have an idea of the time frame. Um, any surprise, the attacks on mining? Um, yes and no. So the, the Democrats are typically looking for more, more money, no matter what they're looking for money, right? And what we knew is after we examined the budget more thoroughly is that there was money we could add back and we also knew there was a big pot of cares act money so federal money was sitting there and had not been deployed so when we are faced with 30 percent unemployment um, businesses closed down why would you go look for another tax and the amount they were looking for was 50 million dollars well we had 50 million dollars going through to k-12 for hazard pay for teachers who actually came into the building and you know like showed up and taught we thought that would be an appropriate way to use the money so there was plenty of money there wasn't any need for taxes but they brought a tax bill and and my understanding is uh, from uh, assemblyman steve yeager uh, that this is going to be an, a bill that's going to be brought up again um, in the next session um, 
you know, w there's been many conversations over the years that you shouldn't be taxing one industry. You should be looking at a mm -hmm. much broader spectrum. This seemed like it was not only one industry, but one company that was being gone after. You know, it was a single industry. And honestly, when we're having hearings at 1 a.m. in the morning, when we can't get public testimony, when we can't get information about how this actually affects the industry and the, and the folks who work in the industry, right? Because there's, there's jobs in mining and then there's all the suppliers and all the vendors that they work with. We didn't have data. So they were looking at a bill to raise taxes when we had a lack of information, a lack of transparency, and we didn't know what the outcomes were gonna be. And as you mentioned, many times, the, the arguments made that everybody needs to be part of a solution, right? Not just one industry. So it was very targeted. And when we have unemployment rates and, and economy on the edge, it just wasn't the right time. And, and again, the transparency, there, was no tra there wasn't transparency. We couldn't even get public input like we typically would during a regular session. So it really wasn't fair game. You know that we had a group of uh, uh, lobbyists as our pundit panel the other day, and uh, they described the session as surreal. Um, and uh, what would, do you describe it as that? And what was your um, interaction with lobbyists? Because in this state, as I pointed out many times, mm -hmm. um, everybody who is at the legislature has an, an actual job that is right, not a right. legislative job. And so lobbyists become very important in telling you um, the various sides of issues. And the ones that don't have integrity get out of the business really quickly because they can't you know, do their job. Um, so you need lobbyists. What was the interaction with the lobbying core? So, so we had some input from lobbyists, but it, I tell you it was surreal because the halls were empty. That the whole place was empty except for staff and legislators. So it was a really different feeling. And what I always appreciate is the public comment. So yes, we have lobbyists who represent industry and they provide important input, but we also have the public who didn't have as much access as they typically do. And I think that's something that we, we miss um, and is really important to have. Quick answer, how many emails a day were you getting and texts? Hundreds, hundreds. But you know, some of it was on taxes. I, the emails, the majority of emails that I get um, are about unemployment insurance and why can't I get my unemployment insurance check and I'm struggling and my family is struggling and we need to pay our bills and we're concerned. So a barrage of those and then later we, you know, we'll get, um, emails on taxes, not to raise taxes, and then we also get emails on education. But I can tell you unemployment is just a hot button and we are buried with emails of people struggling, struggling right now, who can't pay their bills but can't get paid as through unemployment. All right, let's take another break. We'll be back with more with State Senator Heidi Gansard after this time out. Dimitri Prine here for Design Outdoor. Are you a homeowner who's interested in remodeling or building a home? At Design Outdoor, we can show you how adding natural, or manufactured masonry stone can add beauty and value to your home. And we refer only the best contractors. Our store and backyard are located at 11600 South Virginia, just north of DeMonte Ranch Parkway. Visit designoutdoor.com or call us at 851-9499. Hey guys, are you watching the game at a friend's or the bar again because you can't watch at home with your wife? Or worse, because she kicked you out and kept your couch, your flat screen, and your kids? What's the one thing a man needs when he loses a good woman? A good lawyer. And when he loses a bad woman, he needs a great lawyer. What makes a good woman a bad woman? You tell me. You're the one that can't watch the game in your own home. I'm men's rights attorney Marilyn York, and I represent men in divorce, custody, and family law matters. Hi, I'm Dave Newman. Remember me? I used to be the house detective, and now I'm a realtor, full-time at REMAX Realty Affiliates. A lot of people ask me, how's the market? You know what? It's fantastic. If you're even kicking around the idea of buying or selling, give me a call. Let's talk about it. Call me at REMAX Realty Affiliates and just ask for the guy who used to be the house detective, Dave Newman. Everyone is talking about opioids, but they're not the only drugs that can be harmful if taken in large quantities or not as prescribed. You also need to be aware of side effects from anxiety drugs, muscle relaxants, sleep aids, and stimulants. Mixing prescription drugs with other drugs or alcohol can be dangerous. If you take an Ambien with a glass of wine, it may be enough to stop you from breathing. Prescribed drugs can be just as dangerous as illegal drugs. Take medications only as directed. This is Nevada Newsmakers. I'm back on Nevada Newsmakers. We continue our conversation with State Senator Heidi Gansert. Um, 
so we know that the university system and the community college mm -hmm. system is going to take a big hit mm -hmm. um, from all these cuts. Uh, but one of the things that's been coming up again and again recently is that UNR gets funded uh, more so than UNLV and that that disparity needs to be changed. You work for UNR, that's your mm -hmm. day job. Um, do you agree with that statement and if not, why is it not true? Well, it's actually not accurate. So the universities are funded on a weighted student credit hour, so it depends upon how many students are delivered to, or how many credits are delivered to students. But UNR actually has statewide programs, so they have cooperative extens extension, the Small Business Development Center, they've got a med school. And what happens is they put all the money together, whether it's for students or for programs that are statewide, and then divide by the number of students. So it's very misleading. And then on the capital improvement side, the university has used um, contributions, so in endowment funds, contributions, there was a student fee for capital improvements to build most of the buildings on campus. So there's also, the, the only building that has any significant money, that's state money, is the engineering building. Everything else was raised privately or had to do with student funds. So the, the information is misleading, and again, if you take a bigger number that doesn't represent the weighted student credit hours and you divide by the students, uh, that's not the right number. So it, that there isn't a big difference. It's just that the statewide programs, because the university was the original university, um, their budget items fall on the UNR's um, budget line instead of UNLV's budget line. All right, and that's where we've got to yeah. leave it. Thank you so much Thank for you. taking the time to do that. We yeah, really it appreciate it. Yeah, see you. Thank now, you. Now, get some rest. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and we'll be right back. A bird's eye captures its surroundings at different heights. At Brian Culp of Photography, we can make your imagination soar over buildings, parks, cityscapes, and beyond. Brian's images tell the story and get the job done. If you need a new perspective to tell your story, contact Brian today. Brian Culpa Photography. Experience the bird's eye view at brianculpaphotography.com. Oh. Hey, Dad? Are you learning? This place is great. Huh? You gotta try this. Wow, this stuff is great. People are gonna love it. Yes. Yes, they were. As you know, Reno is booming. Toll's development company is helping it grow with insightful design and development building community with every project, adding beauty, adding excitement, emphasizing our shared humanity. Reno is becoming bigger. Toll's development is helping it become better, more livable, more enjoyable. To learn more, go to tollsdevelopment.com, tollsdevelopment.com. Take a look at Pro Group Management and see how your workers' comp requirements can be met head on. By taking a proactive approach, Pro Group can assure that your company is meeting or exceeding state and federal standards. As you move forward in your industry, Pro Group moves with you, simplifying regulatory tasks, clearing the way so you can get the job done and look to your future success. Pro Group Management, workers' comp that works for you. You can now watch Nevada Newsmakers on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and search for Nevada Newsmakers and become a subscriber. We'll see you on the next broadcast. Thanks for watching and listening.